morning. Welcome, everyone. I'm Zhang Zhang, a professor at School of Sears School of Engineering at Dalmers. It's my pleasure to welcome you to um, the Frontiers Translational Medicine Symposium in celebration of 150 years anniversary of Dalmers Engineering. So our symposium today uh, will highlight intersection between engineering and medicine. Um, and the world-renowned speakers we have here will um, represent a array of frontier topics in biomedical engineering. So from bioelectronics, biomechanics, regenerative medicine, synthetic bioengineering, and also the critical thoughts from industry perspective. So towards the end of the day, we're gonna have panel discussions and um, we'll have live discussion on a variety of key elements which enable the successful translating of engineering innovation into medicine. So our opening remarks today will be given by Professor Joe Hebley, the Dean of Sears School of Engineering. I will give a brief introduction to Dean Hebley. Since becoming Dean in 2005, Professor Hebley has led Sears School through a very exciting period of focus and growth. He oversaw the Sears School's centering of research around three key areas with significant societal impact. So one of them is our focus topic for today, engineering medicine, and also in energy in complex systems. And during his tenure, the number of students in each degree program has grown to a record high. And among Dean Hubley's numerous curricular accomplishments at Sears School, including the funding of the national first PhD innovation program, and to prepare our doctor candidates for entrepreneurial success. For this achievement, and Dean Hebley, along with some of the senior colleagues in the Sears School of Engineering, was honored by National Academy of Engineering 2014 Bernard Gordon Prize for Innovation in Engineering and Technology Education. So Dean Hebley's research interests include air pollution, nanotechnology, and he holds multiple patents relevant to nanoscale ceramic powders. And he received the bachelor degree in chemical engineering from Le uh, Lehigh University and a PhD in chemical engineering from MIT. And among his many research uh, awards, he is a recipient of National Science Foundation Career Award and an elected member of Connecticut Academy of Science and Engineering. And with that, let's welcome Dean Hebley for the opening remark. <laughs> Thank you, John, and thanks everyone for joining us today, particularly on a snowy day after a very snowy day that I know made travel challenging. I got back from a day on, out of town late last night to find my car sitting under five or six inches of fresh snow, but you tell yourself it's beautiful, and this is what we love about Hanover this time of year. So a little over a month ago, those of you who were part of the Thayer School of Engineering community know that we gathered for a celebration to mark the start of our sesquicentennial, the 150th anniversary of our founding. And that founding was through a gift, an endowment, as I said at that time, that still lives on to this day, that was given to Dartmouth by the valedictorian of the Dartmouth class of 1807, U.S. Army Colonel Sylvanus Thayer, and that was given, of course, in 1867. Now, 150 years is a long time in American history, but there are, in fact, a few engineering programs that are older or that at least can claim to trace their roots to programs in applied science that started a few years before our founding in 1867. That period, of course, was right after the end of the Civil War. It was a period of significant growth in American higher education, and it was a period in which many schools and programs in engineering were founded. 150 years later, there are certainly also schools of engineering and colleges of engineering that are significantly larger than ours. But one of the things that struck me is that from the beginning, this school of engineering has been distinctly different. Now, as I said a minute ago, I came back late last night to find my car buried in five or six inches of fresh snow. In fact, yesterday I was in New York and I had the opportunity to meet with two members of the Dartmouth class of 1946. So I'll let you do the math and figure out how old these two gentlemen are. One's a former member of Congress. The other one is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. 
One's someone we would consider a liberal arts graduate. The other one's an engineering graduate who went on to a long and productive career as an engineer and also as an engineering writer. But what was apparent from my conversation with the two of them yesterday was that 70 years ago, in the immediate aftermath of World War II, Dartmouth and this engineering school, even at that time, saw itself as something that was distinctly different from the norm in American higher education. And this notion that we have and that we're celebrating today of embracing problems that are at the interface between disciplines, here that span, as John said earlier, this intersection between engineering and medicine and also the liberal arts and business, the kinds of problems in intellectual inquiry that bring students, faculty, and staff together from across the campus is something that was alive and well 70 years ago. It's something that these gentlemen certainly see in the Dartmouth of today, and it's something that I think all of us today, if we are able to transport ourselves back to that very different time in the immediate aftermath of the World War, would recognize. This is a campus in a community that has embraced inquiry at the intersections from the very beginning. And so it's in that spirit that we welcome you here today to have a day-long conversation celebrating these intersections, and in this case, the intersection of engineering and medicine, the role that engineering and engineers can play in tackling significant challenges in healthcare. As John said a few minutes ago, we have distinguished speakers from academia and the private sector, from inside the Dartmouth community and out, joining us for a series of conversations throughout the day that I hope will lead to some thought-provoking conversation. And so we look forward to their presentations. I look forward to hearing the discussions that follow, a panel discussion late this afternoon to ask some questions and probe further what arises during the course of the day, and then, of course, bringing our students and their work together as part of this symposium with a poster session to, to wrap things up. So thanks all of you for joining us. I look forward to the conversations later today. And thanks, John, so much for organizing it. Welcome, everyone. Well, thanks, Joe, for the great opening remark. Um, so we can start the technical program now. And our first speaker in the morning is Professor John Rogers. And he will present uh, for about 45 minutes, then we leave about 15 minutes for questions and answers. So before John starts, I want to have a quick introduction to uh, Professor Rogers' record. You know, this is very long um, a list of a great accomplishment, as you can see from the brochure. I want to highlight a few things. And for um, Professor Rogers, he is currently Lewis Simpson and the Kimberly Quarry Professor in Northwestern University. And John obtained his dual bachelor degree in physics and chemistry from University of Texas of Austin. You know, I spent a long time there as well as, uh, as a faculty member. And John received his uh, master's degree and PhD from MIT and spent a few years in Harvard uh, as a junior fellow. And in his professional career development, he joined the Bell Labs uh, first in the Department of Condensed uh, Matter Physics and later on served as director of this department. And it's great to know that John overlap with Rahu, our own faculty here in Bear Lab, a different department, but now they are here in the same school now. Uh, and afterwards, John spent 13 years as a faculty member in U University of Illinois as Bernard Champion, and most recently as uh, Swanland Chair Professor. He's also director for um, Seeds Materials Research Laboratory. And recently, last year, 2016, John moved to Northwestern with multiple appointments, material science, biomedical engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and so forth, uh, which shows his great impact and this uh, inclusion of multiple disciplines in his own research. So John's research really is on the fundamental and, and applied aspects of nanomolecular scale fabrication um, in terms of you, you know, using noble materials and patterning technique create really unique electronics and the photonics. You know, this is non-conventional, but as you will see from his presentation in the minutes, really has huge um, insights into the existing science and also for applications. And John is very prolific, um, has over 150 papers, and is the inventor of over 100 patents. And in terms of his recognition and awards, there are numerous, and I want to highlight just a couple. 
And Professor Rogers is MacArthur Fellow, and he's also a member of, uh, member of National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Science, and American Academy of Arts and Science, and also a, a, a fellow for National Academy of Inventors and other professional societies. So I will stop here and give the floor to uh, Professor Rogers. Let's welcome uh, Professor John Rogers. Okay, well, uh, thanks a lot for that uh, very detailed uh, introduction. <laughs> Much appreciated, and uh, thanks for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. I've never visited Dartmouth before, but it's an absolutely beautiful campus, and the, and the snow is beautiful as well. <laughs> a bit of a pain, but uh, <laughs> made, it, made it through. Um, and so, you know, I think this is a really amazing milestone, if you think about it. You know, 150 years, it's an, it's an awfully uh, long time. And I was kind of thinking about it this morning, like, you know, what was going on in the U.S. in, in 1867, you know? And so, um, you know, clearly we were just wrapping up the Civil War, and that was, you know, leading to all kinds of reconstruction projects and so on. And um, you know, I had to remind myself, Andrew J uh, Johnson was, uh, was president, you know, in, in 1867. He took over when uh, Lincoln was assassinated in April of 1865. He was uh, elected vice president, was sworn in in March of 1865. So he was vice president for six weeks. Uh, and then he's president, and uh, he got off to a shaky start. Evidently, he, you know, in his acceptance speech for for you know becoming vice president, it was just an absolutely insane, rambling speech. He evidently went into hiding for the next six weeks to avoid all the public ridicule that was coming uh, his direction, uh, and so. There's some interesting parallels, actually, <laughs> to what's going on uh, today, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the political scene, I, I would say. Uh, and, and the other notable thing about uh, and Andrew Johnson is three, la three years later, he was impeached. First uh, president to be uh, impeached, as many of you may know. And he uh, avoided, you know, being convicted in the Senate by one vote. So we barely squeaked by. So, so we have some hope. You know, there may be <laughs> ways to address our, our problems. You know, this is an amazing set of uh, sort of coincidences in, in, in many ways. So anyway, with that, let me um, take some time to, to describe what we've been doing, you know, at this boundary between uh, engineering and medicine. I think it's a real frontier. It's one that you know, represents a, a key focal point for a lot of the, the research that, that we're doing these days. Uh, and just as background, you know, I'm a, a material scientist in, interested in electronic materials, very much a hardware device guy. Uh, and so you're going to see some hardcore engineering you know, in, the next, uh, in the next 40 minutes or so, where our focus has been to try to kind of reformulate the kinds of uh, electronic systems you see in the consumer uh, world today uh, to render them uh, you know, biocompatible in a very profound sense. Um, to enable their, their integration, intimate integration with, with the human body uh, for purposes of uh, potential improvements in, in human health care, cost and efficacy and that, that kind of thing. And so uh, I'll start just by, you know, this is kind of a, a generic, you know, your general audience type of talk. It's not going to be a lot of hardcore, you know, physics and materials mm -hmm. here. And so what I'll do is just uh, start with a little bit of a perspective you know, on, on the electronics industry as it exists today, a little bit of background, and try to put what we're doing in context with things that, you know, everyone is, is, is already familiar with. And then step you through two topics, you know, in this broader space that have been interesting uh, to us. One is in the development of a thin sort of skin-like, what we refer to as epidermal uh, electronics, devices that go on the skin and provide sort of clinical quality uh, data streams related to physiological health. And I'll step you through all the ideas in material science and, and mechanics and electrical engineering that allow you to do that. And, uh, and this is an effort we started about 10 years ago. Uh, and at this point, we have a very crisp idea of where we're going with this uh, in terms of the engineering and the uh, translational uh, medicine uh, you know, aspects uh, of it. Uh, and then, you know, I'll conclude the last third of the talk will be in a space that's a little bit more exploratory for us, new, newer, and, and we kind of have an idea of it, but, but we're still try, trying to figure it out. So, so it's very, very much kind of exploratory mode, um, you know, engineering and, and science-related research in, in, in technologies that, you know, offer electronic functionality but are built with uh, completely biodegradable, water-soluble uh, material uh, constituents. And I'll, I'll describe what, what that's good for and, you know, kind of kind of how you do that sort of thing. And as, as John mentioned, you know, I re just recently moved from uh, University of Illinois to uh, Northwestern. U of I was absolutely fantastic for me. I was there th for 13 years. The deficiency is there's no medical school. And, you know, you want to do engineering and medicine, I think co-location with, with a medical school is a healthy thing. 
Uh, and so we started you know, exploring some, some different uh, opportunities, ended up landing here. My wife grew up in the Chicago area, a lot, a lot of considerations there. So anyway, I, I do, do a lot of engineering science, but then the cool thing is I'm also, I have a real appointment, a paid appointment in neurological surgery, which, which is kind of cool because I don't know anything about surgery, but it's just kind of cool <laughs> to have that, that affiliation on, on my CV, it's kind of, kind of cool. So um, this is uh, you know, the perspective I wanted to start with, which is um, you know, something that, that everybody knows uh, already, but it kind of sets uh, a framework for, for thinking about what, what, what I'm going to tell, tell you about you know, the next, next 40 minutes or so. It's just a quick historical overview of electronics technology. It really started, I think, in a serious way with the invention of the transistor uh, at Bell Labs in the Murray Hill facility, where, where I was fortunate enough to spend, spend five years. And you know, I think in terms of you know, a technology, it might be the most successful technology you know, of all times. I mean, I think you could, you could probably make that, that argument. And, and it's one that um, you know, has seen tremendous technological you know, improvement uh, over the years, primarily driven by just making the devices smaller, packing more and more of them per unit area, and developing manufacturing techniques that allow you to you know, build them at commodity cost. And so you know, in the early days, you, know, you had computing systems that would take uh, up entire rooms. Now you had uh, much higher levels of functionality and power in, in very, very small packages you can put in your pocket or you know, put, put on your wrist or, or slip in, into your backpack. And so from, from a technology standpoint, you know, if you're an uh, uh, electronic uh, material scientist like, like myself, you know, you're interested like, what, what does the future look like? Well, it's pretty, just, pretty much just a linear extrapolation. I mean, that's sort of the dominant future, is just keep doing what, what you've been doing, because, because it works. You know? And so that's Moore's law, just scaling down the, the size of the transistors and developing new materials and manufacturing. Uh, techniques to, to enable that continued scaling. And there's just a ton of really interesting fundamental academic problems in enabling uh, that, that kind of future. And, and that's great. And I would say probably 95% you know, of uh, folks kind of in my field of expertise uh, and they're thinking about electronics, that's the future. And it's all road mapped out. It's very, very well defined. The industry no, knows where things are going. That, that, and that's good. Um, you could think about the technology though in a slightly different way. It's like from the user standpoint. This is from the, the technologist standpoint. But, but like, what do you do with it? And so, you know, in the early days, it was uh, designed primarily for sort of specialized, you know, high-end computational purposes for, for industry and, and scientific uh, research. And the improvement in the technology led to a qualitative expansion in the way the technology was used. You know, from these specialized purposes to things that really permeate all aspects of our our daily lives, sort of a personal level of function, right, in terms of entertainment, communication, uh, productivity enhancement, and so on. And so, you know, another way to look at the future is not so much from the lens of a technologist, but the in, lens of an end user. And so what is all this going to enable, you know, in, in the future? Is there the potential for another kind of qualitative expansion, you know, that can be driven by improvements in, in the technology? And there it's a little fuzzier in terms of where things are going. People have different ideas about that. Uh, you know, Internet of Things, or you know, di different different kind, kinds of vision uh, for 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 what's going to happen uh, in in the future. But but that's I guess you know a motivating uh, you know factor in, in what I'm going to tell you about, which is you know to think about whether you you could take it from sort of this personal handheld device to you know things that really integrate in an intimate way with with biology. So solving this biotic a abiotic <coughs> interface uh, challenge to try to bring some of this kind of sophistication to bear on. Uh, you know problems in in human health, and so you know the brain is probably the most obvious example of where where that might uh, have utility in terms of a concept. You know, uh, the brain is is biology's most sophisticated form of electronics. You want to know how the brain works, or you want to uh, treat disorders of the brain. It might make sense to think about how to take man's most sophisticated form of electronics and do do some kind of you know intimate integration. And then the, then the problem is pretty obvious at that point, which is that every commercially available you know integrated circuit that's ever been built and sold from the very earliest days of the industry has been constructed on rigid planar substrates, and so that's reflected in the form factor of your uh, of your iPhone or, or, or your smart smartphone. It's great great device, very planar. You can't bend it, and so how in the world are you going to take that technology and sort of integrate it in an intimate way with the textured surface of, of the brain, which has you know the, the modulus of a, a bowl of jello essentially, and it's moving around. You know, how, how are you going to do that? And um, that kind of challenge is not going to be satisfied by making transistors smaller and smaller all the time. You have to be able to think about something qualitatively different uh, in terms of driving this uh, vision of the future, where you're focused on uh, mechanics and uh, materials level uh, biocompatibility and, and geometry to try to sort of fundamentally reformulate electronics to look like biology. 
That's what you want to try try to do in in, in this you know direction. And so so how how do you you know create things that you could laminate onto the brain? If you could do that, you you wouldn't stop there. You would do a lot of other things. You know, other or critical organ systems, the body, you know, the heart's the electromechanical system. So if you could wrap a circuit around the epicardial surface, maybe you could do some interesting forms of pacemaking or electrophysiological spatiotemporal mapping that would be relevant to treating arrhythmias, for example. Or the skin, you know, by, uh, the body's largest uh, organ system, you know, if you could create skin-like electronics that would sort of laminate, you know, directly onto the epidermis, you might be able to use the skin as a window for making precise measurements of uh, physiological uh, health and move beyond the, these kinds of device architectures, which, which have all kinds of deficiencies in terms of, you know, uh, accuracy and precision of, of data streams to something that would uh, yield information that can quali quantitatively correlate to clinical gold standards and yield actionable information that a physician can uh, interpret and understand. So that, that's the future. It's parallel with, but fundamentally different with, uh, from the uh, Moore's Law, you know, scaling uh, vision of, of a future uh, of electronics. So I'm going to step you through concepts that allow you to do skin integration, but bear in mind that the same ideas uh, apply to all, all different kinds of uh, organ systems. And we've done a lot of work in the brain and the heart uh, using some, some of these uh, same concepts. So what, what would a skin integrated device look like? I mean, what, what would be the model or the paradigm for, for thinking about that? And uh, we decided early on, you know, that the kid's temporary tattoo would like, be, be maybe the ideal way to think about it. And, uh, you know, it's a piece of technology at some level. You know, you put it on your skin, uh, it looks great. Uh, and then you kind of forget that it's even there, which, which is the beauty of it, right? Because it's so thin, it's so compliant, there's no inertial or mechanical constraint on the natural motions of the skin. Uh, and that, and that, that's interesting. And, and it establishes a, a, a constant, you know, intimate physical interface with the skin relevant for measurement. So, so what would it look like? It'd be ultra thin, so maybe five microns, the 20th, you know, the diameter of a human hair. You'd want it to be super lightweight in an area sort of mass loading sense, so comparable to the epidermis itself, maybe a milligram per centimeter squared. You'd like to be uh, very, very soft. Uh, the modulus uh, would need to be as low as possible. Maybe comparable to the brain would be best, five kilopascals, uh, but the skin is 100, so even 100 would probably be okay. Um, it would obviously need to be able to bend, but it would also need to be able to stretch because uh, skin stretches like a rubber band up to about 30% you know, uh, strain and then it begins to tear. So you need, need to be able to stretch at least that much. Um, and then other characteristics you'd need to worry about, so you need to be air and water permeable to uh, accommodate sweating and um, uh, transepidermal water loss. Uh, but at the same time, you'd like the active electronics and the sensor components to be sealed against biofluids, sort of wa waterproof to, to, to avoid degradation in their characteristics or unwanted you know, electrical leakage into the uh, uh, surrounding uh, bi biology. So that, that's, that's what uh, you know, we kind of had in mind when, when we started uh, you know, down, down this path. And, and why? You know, why? Why would you want to do that? You know, it may be a more convenient way to carry your cell phone around, but that wouldn't be a, a, a great motivation for you know, spending a lot of time on that from the standpoint of convenience. What it does is it allows you to reproduce clinical grade measurements in a continuous sort of wearable format. So what am I talking about? I give you many, many examples, but just give you a sense. One, uh, electrocardiograms require some electrical interface to the body currently in the form of paste on electrodes and wires that attach to external boxes uh, of electronics. You need physical contact to do that. This is the way it's done in clinics and uh, laboratories. That's not wearable. Um, you know, it, it creates uh, irritation at the skin interface. I mean, there's a kind of hundred, you know, deficiencies of that. But, but anyway, that, that's what's done. You'd like to be able to collect si uh, similar data streams, you know, in, in its skin-like skin form. Or hydration, you know, if you want to measure the, the, the hydration, the water content of the skin, you do that with a corneometer. That's uh, this tool here. And, it, you know, it's currently configured. You press an electrode pair against the skin. You make your measurement. You peel it, uh, pull, pull it off. Good for the clinic. Not good if you want to continuously monitor changes in hydration of the skin. Here's another example. Uh, arterial tonometry basically uses this kind of pressure sensing rig uh, that's strapped to the uh, to a region of the skin where there's a near surface artery. And then you can measure the time dynamics of pulse little blood flow com com coming through the arteries. And those waveforms tell you a lot about cardiovascular health. And you know, there's a tremendous database going back decades and decades uh, that, that physicians you know, know, know how to interpret those, uh, those types, types of traces. And, and I think you need to be able to make those sorts of measurements. And you can't do it if you have a rigid block of electronics you know, strapped to the body with, with a wristband. It just, just doesn't work. It doesn't establish that continuous intimate 
intimate interface that you really need. So, so if you want to make tattoo ele uh, like uh, electronics, like how, how do you do it? I mean, it's essentially a materials problem at some level. And the most challenging material in any kind of form of electronics is the semiconductor. So what are you going to use? You might think uh, or naively be drawn to polymer-based plastic semiconductors. And there's, there's a finite set of those kinds of materials. We spent a lot of time on this uh, over the years. And you might you know, think that you know, the polymers offer kind of a, a bendable you know, characteristic. And it would be reasonable to think that that would be a good starting point for integration you know, with, with a tissue system like, like the brain. But the, but the problem is that the, the charge transport characteristics of known polymer-based semiconductors are pretty lousy. Uh, and so these are field effect mobilities, not, not that important, but orders of magnitude uh, worse, you know, in terms of electronic characteristics compared to silicon. So maybe there's a breakthrough in polymers and allow you to move up here so you can do things beyond just simple display systems and maybe, you know, microprocessors and radios and other things that you probably ultimately want to be able to do. You can't do it with polymers now, maybe in the future. So it's still worth thinking about those materials, other kinds of carbon-based materials as well, but they're all relatively immature. Uh, as a technology. And so good, good for academic research, but if you want something that translates and, and really has a potential to, to move into the clinic on a reasonable sh uh, short time scale, uh, you might be drawn to silicon, you know, and, and st you, know, you might start asking questions around, you know, how, how can I, um, you know, deploy silicon in a, in a way that allows that kind of integration? It may seem like a really hard problem because, you know, the way silicon is currently used in the integrated circuit industry is in this format. So it's basically plates of very pure, you know, highly sophisticated from a material standpoint, uh, uh, pieces of, of silicon. Um, and this is great because it's, it's very, very flat. It's compatible with the kinds of optical approaches that are used to fa uh, manufacture integrated circuits. Materials quality is, is uh, extreme, extremely high. You can do the, you create these wafers at commodity cost. But they're you know, incompatible, fundamentally incompatible with biology for reasons that I already described. They're planar. They basically have the properties of a plate of glass, essentially, the way you can think about it. So you drop it on the floor, it shatters into a million pieces. You can't bend it. And so it's not a good good starting point. Uh, and you may an, initially, you know, on that basis, you know, make, make a conclusion that, that silicon is never going to work uh, for the for these uh, types of biointegrated uh, applications. But but that would be wrong, and, and it's wrong for uh, you know two two reasons. If, you know, two simple ideas allow you to bypass what appear to be fundamental constraints, and like it's incredibly simple uh, actually, and. Um, Powerful as a result, I, I think. So I, I won't go through the details. There's a ton, ton of engineering, you know, um, detail around this, and it's not appropriate for this talk. But just to give, give you the two ideas, one is that if you make any material uh, thin enough, it becomes flexible. So you know, a two by four is a rigid, you know, piece of material. A sheet of paper is flexible. It's the same material. It's just by virtue of the fact that the paper is thin, it's flexible. So in particular, the bending rigidity scales down with the cube of the thickness. So if you go from a silicon wafer that's a millimeter thick. And you figure out ways to slice from the near surface region of the wafer, device grade silicon that has you know, thickness of 0.1 microns, uh, then you've reduced the bending stiffness by 12, 13 orders of magnitude. Uh, and in that format, the very thin format, silicon's flexible. So that's great. So you can make silicon flexible. It's pretty easy. Just make it thin. It's just Newtonian mechanics. You can take that kind of material, you can put it on a sheet of plastic, and boom, you have the basis for uh, a flexible uh, integrated circuit, but but it turns out you know as I mentioned before, flexible is not really good enough. Your, your your skin stretches, and so you need something not only flexes but can stretch. And furthermore, if you have a, a system that only can bend, then you can wrap simple geometric shapes like cylinders and cones, but you can't even do a sphere, much less a heart or a brain. So you need something that not only bends but also stretches, more like a rubber band. So that requires a separate idea added on top of this one which is that you take these thin ribbons and you bond them to an underlying rubber substrate, a silicone type material, but you don't bond them in a flat geometry, you bond them in this kind of wavy type of configuration. And so now you have a hard, soft composite material where the hard component is providing electronic functionality, the soft component is giving you the overall mechanics uh, in such a way that the, the composite system can kind of stretch back and forth uh, without cracking the silicon because these wave shapes can change uh, in accordance with those kinds of deformations. And so you think about it, it, it you know, qualitatively, essentially an accordion bell is made out, of, made out of silicon. So with those two basic ideas and lots of engineering elaboration added on top of those concepts, you can essentially build silicon integrated circuits with any kind of mechanics, any kind of geometry you want. There's really no, no constraint. These ideas turn out to be very powerful. And not only applicable to silicon, but any kind of inorganic semiconductor. You want to do LEDs or solar cells, these, these kinds of ideas allow you to do that. So those, those are the basic concepts. Here's a, you know, a little bit more sophisticated deployment of them where we're exploiting not only 
sort of out of plane buckling, but also in plane buckling uh, as well by use of these thin filamentary ribbons uh, in this kind of mesh architecture. So all your active device functionality is sitting on this platform, which in turn is bonded uh, to a very thin, very low modulus silicone substrate. And if you pay attention to the details of the mechanics, you, uh, you do, do quantitative modeling of the mechanics, you can choose the layouts here to basically quantitatively match a targeted tissue like the skin. So in spite of the fact that uh, silicon is about a factor of 100 million times stiffer than skin, you can create an effective composite where, where the, where the uh, stress strain properties are, are completely uh, overlapping. So this is experimental results modeling result that's actual skin. So it goes, starts to go nonlinear around uh, 15%, uh, 15, uh, percent, but you can, you can match the, the linear regime uh, pretty, pretty well. So uh, there's a lot of detail here. I, I'm just going to skip through it because, because it's going to end, end up uh, taking a little bit too, too much time. But, but just you know, make the argument, that, again, that you can kind of do whatever you want in terms of mechanics. Here's an example of geometry. It's not only talking about macro scale geometry, wrapping the surface of the brain, but actually the micro texture that's present as well. And so this is an example of a polymer replica of human skin. So your skin is actually very, very rough, as you probably know, sort of on a, on a micron uh, length scale. But, but this kind of uh, you know, filamentary spider web, you know, mesh type architecture gets you the mechanics you want, but it also gets you the geometric conformality you know, that you need if you want a high precision measurement interface. You want good contact. You measure electrical activity through the skin. You want a good, good interface or, or thermal characteristics uh, as well. So I'm not going to go through all of the different sensor modalities. We've done a ton, ton of work, but just come back and revisit the, the slide that I, uh, that I use as a motivation uh, for, for this kind of uh, technology and, and just make the, make the uh, claim that you can act, in fact measure clinical quality electrocardiograms with these kind of skin-like uh, devices where you capture all of the detailed features of the waveforms that physicians need in order to make an assessment of cardiovascular health. You can do that. You can measure hydration. You replace the corneometer with a tattoo-like you know, piece of electronics. Here we're doing hydration using a thermal-based approach but works very well, quantitatively matches up with a, a corneometer. You can insert piezoelectric materials, so pressure sensing materials in these same kind of platforms. You can replace a traditional arterial tonometer with something skin-like that, that's wearable. You can capture the same type of waveform. So on and on, there's lot, lots of things uh, you can do. Again, uh, from, for uh, sake of time, I'm just going to you know, kind, of, kind of summarize it. If you're interested, I'd be happy to uh, talk to you. You can measure uh, sounds associated uh, with uh, processes uh, in, the, in the body, strain, emotion, sweat, sweat loss, sweat chemistry, biopotential, ECG is just one example, brain waves, uh, electromyograms, all, all sort, sorts of stuff uh, as well. But let me just shift to uh, you know, a specific clinical use case that we've been thinking about the last uh, five years. And so this is sort of, sort of an old slide, but it helped to kind of guide the students, you know, thought process on something that, you know, we, we perceive as, a, as an important thing, thing to spend some time on. So if you go to the uh, uh, hospital, you go to the children's hospital and you take a look at what's, what's happening in the neonatal intensive care unit, probably many of you are familiar with this. If you have a premature baby, you know, the health status is extremely fragile. You need to do full continuous vital signs monitoring. Um, to, to avoid, you know, you know potential uh, catastrophe. And this is what it looks like. So, you know, this premature baby, the skin's very fragile, the muscles are not very well developed, and then you strap them up with all this kind of hardware, you know, paste on electrodes, tapes, bulky wires, uh, and you're measuring everything, right? Uh, ECG, respiration rate, heart rate, heart rate variability, blood pressure, oximetry, SpO2, PPG, on and on. Uh, and this out done, and, and all the boxes of electronics are sitting outside of the isolate. This is a big problem because uh, you know, for obvious reasons. One is the skin is not very well developed, so there are uh, cases where you, know, you develop sort of lifetime scarring associated with application and removal of the tape uh, you know, associated with this monitoring uh, hardware. The other problem is that the muscles are not well developed, so all the mass and mechanics associated with these wires constrain the ability of the baby to, to move in a natural way. And then maybe the most significant thing is it frustrates the kind of mother-child interactions that are so important for a healthy development uh, of, a, of a baby at this stage of life, because you've got to rip all this stuff off. Mother holds a baby, put it back in, got to put all the stuff back on again. And so, so it's a problem, and so we decided, you know, that, that's something that, you know, maybe we could, uh, we, we, we could address. And so this, this was just PowerPoint, so, uh, sorry, Photoshop. So this is, uh, you know, uh, just, just clip art, and we you know, pasted some of these 
uh, you know, uh, tattoo uh, electronics on your division was, you know, kind of reproduce all of this with, you know, two, two or three of those devices. And so, so we can do all of that uh, at this point. Let me just step you through, you know, some, some of the, the concepts that enable it. So, so one is, you know, how do you do uh, wireless, right? I mean, that, that's kind of, kind of the key thing. I didn't really say anything about that up to this point, just sensors and electronics. You know, how do you do wireless? Like RF devices are typically very sensitive to geometry and positioning of the different components, especially the antenna, right? It's resonant frequency is a function of its, uh, if its geometry. And so if you want to do, you know, a antenna design, you really have to think pretty carefully about it because you want the deformability to allow the skin compatibility, but, but you need to have this kind of uh, structure to form in a way that doesn't alter its RF characteristics in, in a significant manner that would uh, you know, adversely impact the, the function. And so, you know, kind of lo looked at this, it becomes a sort of challenge in, in multi-physics modeling and optimization, where now you have to think not only about circuit topology and layout, not only about skin-compatible mechanics, uh, but also uh, strain-invariant RF response. And so you really have to pay, pay attention to the mechanics. So this is an example of one of these magnetic loop antennas in uniaxial tension. We can capture all the mechanics using 3D FEM, but now we have to go one step further in the sense that we need to model the electromagnetic characteristics of that deformed antenna and then ask the question, what's the center frequency and how does that change with deformation? And so through a series of optimization uh, you know, processes, we are able to uh, create sort of strain uh, in invariant uh, you know, RF property, you know, the spelling error there, unfortunately. Anyway, it's flat. Uh, the simulation and the experimental uh, results sort of, sort of match up. So you can do antennas. Here's an example of a device like that designed to interact with um, smartphones. So it's a very simple thing. We added graphics on top just, just for the fun of it, for pot pirate uh, shape. And th this movie will show operation of this device, even in an extreme state of deformation. So again, it has skin-like uh, mechanics and strain invariant RF uh, characteristics. So here it is squeezed down pretty, pretty tightly and uh, we're showing that we can still uh, interact with, with a smartphone. So we just download data. It's just a data tattoo. You pick up, pick up you know, a simple message that was stored on the, um, uh, on the device. And when I showed this uh, to somebody one of the first times, he said, hey, that's pretty cool. You designed the device so you can like, squeeze the data out. Uh, that, that wasn't the, the point. It just showed that it's uh, invariant to, to deformation. So I actually have one of these on uh, my arm right right now. You can come up and check it out later uh, if if you want. So uh, it's one of, one of these devices. Stay on for maybe two three weeks. It's not, not a problem. And uh, they're thin enough that they're they're breathable. And uh, because they're thin and soft, there are very small interface stresses that would otherwise try to drive delamination. So it so it doesn't require you know super adhesive to keep this thing uh, on on the skin. Uh, and I have a. So anyway, it's a very, very cheesy, uh, cheesy demo. I apologize for that, but I kind of kind of have to do it. You know, I'm a, I'm a device guy, so it's fun. Uh, anyway, who cares about that? Well, a few people, not, not a lot, but, but a few, few people. Uh, one one, one uh, group that does care is L'Oreal. They, they have a, uh, a division that's uh, called La Roche Pose. So they have a dominant market position in sunscreen. And so they got interested in whether we could use this technology to uh, do UV dosimetry. And so we worked together with them, launched a product at CES last year. Uh, so they did a million units in 2016, probably three to five million uh, this year. And it's basically exactly what I just showed you, but instead of static graphics, we have a, a printed pattern uh, where we use specially formulated chemical dyes that are UV sensitive. And so they change color as uh, you know, you're exposed to sunlight. And so the idea is you give these things away with every bottle of sunscreen and provide a way for your customer to, um, to determine the amount of sunscreen. Very low, low in 
cost, but, but what about the uh, neonatal uh, application? How, how is this relevant? It's relevant because there's tremendous advances happening in uh, miniaturized RF electronics, primarily driven by Internet of Things. I don't think people have really kind of picked up yet on, on the biomedical uh, applications. And, and we have a, an agreement with TI. So this is a prototype chip from TI, very tiny chip, about a half millimeter on the side. You can grind it down to about 25 microns in thickness. It has a full CPU, MSP430, onboard memory, four A to B channels, uh, power regulator, uh, and an NFC wireless interface to an external reader that allows it to receive power and also transmit data back. So you can build a battery-free system. You interface it with all these uh, sensors that I was talking about. And you can put together you know, devices that, that do interesting things uh, in terms of measuring quantities that are relevant for uh, vital science tracking. And um, you can deliver a lot of power, actually, battery-free, uh, about a range of a meter. You can deliver maybe 20, 50 milliwatts, depending on the details. And so you can run uh, LEDs, not just electronics. There's a pair of LEDs here, a photo detector. We can do blood oximetry in this way, full PPG. Waveforms can, can be recorded uh, in that ma manner. It starts to get a little bit tricky in terms of the electrical engineering because there's very limited you know, uh, processing uh, capacity. I won't go through the de details here, but, but you can uh, do, do some clever things from the standpoint of system level uh, electrical engineering to, to bypass some of those apparent constraints. So you can do you know, optical measurements, you can do electrical. So here's uh, you know, two uh, electrode interfaces in the skin. That's the NFC electronics. There's the loop antenna. And this is ECG measured with this device, about two and a half bucks uh, worth of components. And this is clinical standard. It's $50,000 and uh, wire, you know, with, with all the hardware that I showed you before, this is skin like. So you have a pretty, pretty good quantitative uh, lineup between these, these two radically different types of uh, platforms. There's some movies uh, showing this uh, in operation. This was a near, near uh, short range reader. I'll show you long range. And so you can also, because you have the MSP430 there, you can do onboard signal processing. You don't have to stream all the data. You can do some data aggregation at the patch and then just send uh, you know, uh, lo lower uh, bitrate data, data streams uh, that, that have some amount of pre-processing. Here's an example of that. So sitting on the, on the chest, one meter away, we have a, a long range um, uh, loop, loop antenna. And so it's um, delivering power to this device, unfortunately, let's see. Uh, yeah, there we go. So it's delivering power to the device, and that LED is flashing every time uh, we detect a peak uh, in, in ECG recording. So you just eyeball the device. You take a look at how fast the LED is uh, blinking. That, that's synchronized with, with the heart, heartbeat. So this is uh, you know, one of the, the, the most uh, you know, satisfying uh, images of, of you know, results of, of group, group work and, and, and research that, that has ever come out. So this just uh, happened. Uh, in, in the fall. So getting the approvals to get a new technology into the neonatal intensive care unit is extremely challenging. <laughs> I would say probably babies are the most valuable thing in a hospital and, and there's all kinds of scrutiny. It took us nine months just to get the approvals when we were there. This is the first baby that we did. This is in the isolate, so there's a, uh, a loop antenna in the base of the mattress. It gives us full coverage across the isolate. There's the device. Uh, and we're very, very proud of that outcome of group activity. But this slide is even more satisfying because this is also an outcome of group activity because a, a grad student got married to a postdoc and they had a, had a baby. That, that's, true, that's a true story, actually. So this is a very, very special uh, image. So it all works. And uh, you, know, you get into this and, and you make measurements on lots of babies and stuff. And uh, you begin to realize some, some kind of cool, cool things. So th this was kind of a funny. Thing. So, so this is a, a six month, obviously this is not neonatal, this is just uh, in an outpatient sense. Here's the, the hard wire. So usually we're, we're collecting data wirelessly, loop antennas in, in, the, in the mattress, uh, and then simultaneously with wires, right? So we can do the control uh, comparison. But, but this guy, and you can tell the expression on his face, is having nothing to do with these wires. He does not like the wires. So we could never keep the electrodes on this particular baby. Kept, kept ripping them off. And, and the whole time, he never seemed to notice there was anything on his chest, just completely oblivious to it. So anyway, that, that, that was kind of the engineering goal, and it was kind of fun to see that. So anyway, now that we're sort of embedded with uh, a medical school, it's basically blowout uh, in terms of the pull for these kinds of uh, technologies. So we have things going on, stroke rehab. We have 30 patients there. We have devices in the OR, uh, neurosurgery with Michelle Clio. We have devices that are monitoring uh, the interface between residual limbs and prosthetics on real uh, amputees and so on. It's, it's really uh, fun, actually. There's just all kinds of um, opportunities to drive, drive the engineering. 
So with the last um, 12, 13 minutes I have, let me shift gears and talk about this other area. It's a little bit newer for us, a little bit more exploratory, but I think we're beginning to uh, understand the utility. And uh, the best way to, to introduce it is to uh, motivate it by uh, the, in the following way. So, so the skin devices I, I described can be used in the brain and the heart. We've done a lot in both of these areas. If you look at the clinical use cases for technologies like this, you know, they tend to fall into two extremes in terms of the time for integration in the body. Uh, for certain of these devices that go on the brain, they only need to be there a few, for a few hours because they're used in a clinical, sort of a surgical diagnostic sense. And, and that's an interesting use case. In the case of devices that go on the heart, you might think of complex spatiotemporally controlled pacemaking. And in that case, the device needs to last life of the patient. So 50 minutes or 50 hours, uh, sorry, 50 minutes or 50 years. Those, those are the two, two limits when, when you start thinking about these. And they have totally different kinds of uh, materials challenges associated with them. But it turns out you start interacting with clinicians and, and think about the, the problem space that they're operating in, that there are uh, opportunities for devices that, that have uh, you know, integration times between those, those two limits. For example, devices that might go in the body as temporary implants and serve a function that's correlated to a transient body process like wound healing. You might need the device there to do some monitoring, do some therapy to accelerate wound healing, but then once the wound is healed, you don't need the device there anymore. And the fact that it's, that it, it's there represents, at that point, unnecessary risk and load, device load on the patient. And so you either have to do a secondary surgical extraction or you have to think about creating devices that resorb and just disappear, almost like a resorbable suture, but with full electronic functionality. And so that created a, a, another way to think about sort of a future in electronics, where you know, the, the goal is to generate devices that are, that are biologically or environmentally uh, resorbable uh, in the sense that they're, they're uh, water soluble uh, to uh, benign end products. And if you think about a device like that, it has had a well-defined lifetime and then it disappears, it's very much orthogonal to everything that's happened in the electronics industry up to this point, where the main appeal of the transistor was its solid state operation and the ability to engineer it for infinite lifetime. And essentially, the community has been very successful at that. I mean, you have cell phones now where the microprocessor in the cell phone will realistically last 50 years, 100 years. But that doesn't make any sense because nobody wants to keep their cell phone for more than about one year or two years. And so not only in these kinds of implant uh, applications, maybe you could think about you know, environmentally low impact uh, electronics. And so it's really a broader space of technology than, than temporary implants. It's sort of transient electronics is how we're referring to it. So it's any kind of electronic system designed to fully or partly dissolve or resorb or otherwise physically disappear at a programmed rate or triggered uh, time. And um, you know, the applications are here. So I t uh, already mentioned implantable therapeutics diagnostics. I'll give you a specific example of what, what we're doing here. But generically, I think there are a lot of opportunities there. Environmental monitors or sensors you can just distribute in the field. You don't have to worry about recovery. You don't have to worry about recycling or you know, damage to the environment, or you'll reduce uh, or you know zero electronic waste, consumer electronics to to eliminate uh, that problem. And so the, these are our uh, the areas that we're most sort of personally interested in. This is what pays most of the bills. Uh, it turns out there are lots of military uh, applications as well, and I can't tell you about the details there, but but you can imagine you know what what, what might be might be possible in in transient electronics for for military. So it's back to a materials problem. Uh, and that's good because I'm a material scientist. So, uh, what are you going to use for for the semi, uh, semiconductors? Back back to that core question for transient electrons. How do you use water soluble semiconductors? Again, you may be naively drawn to polymers because there's tremendous chemical versatility in polymers. And maybe you could cook up a, cook up a certain chemistry that has great charge transport properties and it's also water soluble and biocompatible. Maybe. Um, but maybe not, because uh, people have been working on this for a quarter century, and they're sort of still sort of down here in this low performance regime. So as before, you know, if you could figure out how to use silicon for that kind of system, uh, that's what you would do, because you're, you would be building on a tremendous base of knowledge and engineering capability that's already grown around silicon as a result of a half century worth of global R&D on, on that material for uh, electronics. But again, as before, you might think that it's never going to work because uh, you know, anybody who's sort of played around with a silicon wafer, you quickly develop an intuition that you know, silicon uh, in this wafer form is more or less like a brick. 
or rock from the standpoint of its water solubility. When you put this in a bucket of water, nothing, nothing's going to happen. It just, just sits there, right? And so I think to first order, uh, the community, you know, just, you, you just sort of intuitively think, think of silicon as, um, you know, something that's not water soluble. But it turns out it is water soluble. And this was a, a major, uh, you know, uh, thing that we sort of stum stumbled uh, across, you know, a few, few years back. And um, it's just soluble at like a super, super slow rate. So you would never see it at the scale of a wafer. But if you're playing around with a super thin silicon like we were in this other context, uh, and you're a patient, you put this thin silicon, these are AFM images, about 100 nanometers thick, you put it in a phosphate buffered saline, sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know just, just electrolyte solution at physiological pH uh, and temperature, and you watch what happens over the course of two, three weeks, it's gone. It completely dissolves. Uh, and that was amazing. And, and if you look at, uh, you know, the kinetics of that, it's basically surface erosion, very well controlled linear kinetics, start out at some thickness, and this is time and day. So again, it's super slow, uh, but, but it's happening at a few nanometers uh, per day. So a few atomic layers per day is, is how fast it dissolves. And this is the chemistry. It's silicon reacting with water to form silicic acid and hydrogen. You might say hydrogen, that's not good, but it's a tiny, tiny amount of silicon. So hydrogen just ends up dissolved in the surrounding water. And silicic acid is naturally occurring in biofluids anyway. Um, at concentrations that way exceed the concentration of the silicic acid produced by that dissolution process. So this is a little bit material science. I, I'm run, running short, so let me just skip, uh, skip through that and then just drive home the point that I just made, which is uh, silicon in these very, very thin formats, say 35 nanometers, thick enough to do all the kinds of electronics you might be interested in. In uh, physiological conditions, it's dissolving in 10 days. It's gone, three, three nanometers per day, roughly. You only need about a half a milliliter of water to avoid solubility limits of the silicic acid for an area of one centimeter squared. Again, relative to a silicon wafer, which is almost a millimeter thick, you're talking about 1,000 years. And you're talking about eight liters of water to uh, be able to dissolve a chip that's a centimeter squared. So this is probably OK to put in your body, but that you probably, you probably don't want to do that. So uh, thin, thin geometry is really important. Silicon can be added then with dielectrics and metals and all kinds of things. You can piece it all together. We've written many, many papers on all kinds of uh, water-soluble electronic materials. I won't mention that, but just say uh, you can put it all together and begin to do things that are pretty sophisticated and high performance from an electronic standpoint, but where the unique defining characteristic is that everything is water-soluble at a molecular level, environmentally benign and biocompatible end products. That's it. So, so this is a, uh, a coal pits oscillator. We're using magnesium as the interconnect metal. Silicon as the semiconductor. Silicon dioxide and mag magnesium oxide as the dielectrics. So there's a transistor, a diode, a resistor, inductor, a capacitor. You put it all together. It oscillates as it should. Uh, but you know, if you immerse it in, in water, you know, every, everything uh, uh, dissolves away. So this is a movie we made for uh, DARPA just to show you know, how, how it works. This is a silk substrate. So uh, it's a thin sort of plastic-like -like materials, bi biomaterial, obviously, and then the Culpitz oscillators on time. This is uh, amorphous silk, so it dissolves very quickly. But the idea is you drop you know, inadvertently high, high, highly sensitive uh, electronics in the field don't worry, uh, your adversary won't collect that because it'll, it'll dissolve next time it rains and, uh, and go away. So, so that, that was kind of, the, uh, kind, of, kind of the idea. So if you're going to use that for a non-military application, you want to put it in your body, you want to eat it or you know, insert it into uh, you know, uh, you know, the intracranial space, you know, what, what about the biocompatibility? And so think about you know, what, what kinds of elements and compounds are, are in this piece of electronics. Silk is already FDA approved for resorbital sutures, so that's fine. It's also edible, uh, but it's mostly magnesium and silicon, sort of the active parts. So it's very, very thin. So if you look at the mass content, it's only about 100 micrograms of magnesium in that oscillator and three micrograms of silicon. Well, it turns out magnesium and silicon are recommended parts of daily diet. And in fact, if you look at a multivitamin tablet, one a day uh, tablet, it has 300 milligrams of magnesium. 3,000 times more, and, and silicon likewise, 3,000 times more. So, so you can think about this as a uh, your water-soluble transient electronic device or like a really terrible vitamin tablet because you've got to take like 3,000 of those things to, uh, to eat one of those things. So, so you might be wondering, and the answer is yes, uh, we don't make a habit of this, but it's sort of irresistible to try, try it out. So I actually have eaten one of these things, and so it's basically just melt in your mouth and it's gone. It's not, not, not too exciting. And, um, 
at least to my knowledge, there has been no adverse health consequence. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so let, let me, I have four minutes. i just give you one specific example. We have about half a dozen things that we're working on that are addressing specific unmet clinical needs. But this, this one that we spent, spent a lot of time on. So this was an opportunity that was brought to us by neurosurgeons at Washington University, neurosurgeons who specialize in the treatment of traumatic brain injury, severe traumatic brain injury. So somebody who's a very bad uh, injury to the head comes into the uh, uh, emergency room, they do an operation, and then at the tail end of that, they insert into the intracranial space pressure and temperature sensors, because if the pressure exceeds some nominal value, it's a problem, and the uh, physician needs to know about that, so they go in and, and do something. And the problem is that you know they're non-degradable sensors, uh, but they're only needed during that critical risk period during the initial healing stage, so you need to pull it out. Uh, after you know about a, about a week, typically it's wired, so it restricts movement and frustrates sort of the healing process and recuperation process, and has an external interface, and so that can be a nidus for infection and hemorrhage. And so they came to us and said, "Hey, you guys can make uh, these bioresorbable devices. How about a bioresorbable pressure sensor? We put it in the intracranial space. You don't have to extract it. It offers functionality, and then just naturally dissolves. And you can make it wireless." get rid of uh, you know, the, the constraints on freedom of motion, we could fully suture the site, uh, and you can uh, make, make it uh, you know, into a min minimally risk, um, you know, uh, reduce the risk profile. So these are a bit, bit of details. You, you can do all of that. So we spent two, uh, two years on this, published it last year, and um, it's basically a, a micro electromechanical device made out of purely bioresorbable materials. So it's a, it's a trench etched on the surface of a nanoporous silicon substrate. We cap it with a thin biodegradable polymer to make a drum head. Uh, as intracranial uh, fluid uh, changes in pressure, it deflects that drum head. We can measure it out electrically using piezoresistive response of a very thin silicon serpentine that we put on the edge. And so you have an electrical uh, device for measuring, uh, measuring pressure. And it works. Uh, it correlates to uh, clinical gold standards, non-degradable. You see these pressure transients, about the same precision and accuracy over a physiologically re relevant range of pressures, here of 0 to 100 millimeters of mercury, uh, roughly. Uh, and you're measuring resistance, but that can be calibrated to pressure. And they offer stable operation for four or five days. We'd like to push that to three, four weeks. So that's, that's a topic of current work, but al already th four, four or five days on the front end of what's relevant. You know, uh, cl clinically. So here's one, one of these devices. It was just a GIF uh, animation of various stages of its dissolution. It's gone uh, like that uh, over time. And this is my last slide. And so um, here's some results of uh, animal tests. We've done lots of animal tests, primarily rats. Uh, that's what they use for uh, TBI uh, animal tests at, uh, at Wash U. And so it's like two subsystems. One is the sensor itself, goes in the intracranial space. We have fine molybdenum wires, dissolvable wires, connects to a wireless module that sits just under the skin. Uh, and so the whole thing can be sutured up and then you continuously transmit wireless information, pressure and temperature uh, in this case. So here's an example of temperature. So here the uh, rat is recovering from surgery, temperature's going up. Uh, our collaborators put the rat in something called an ice sauna. I don't know what that is, you could probably imagine. And that cools it down, uh, track, tracks down, and the commercial and the transient sensor are lined up. Pressure is harder. This is uh, resistance as a function of time from the transient one. It's basically a stable baseline, modulated every now and then by respiration. So just natural breathing patterns change the intracranial pressure a little bit. And then these spikes are associated with something that uh, our collaborators refer to as a teratric response. So I guess it's a standard thing that you do with rats. So basically, you pick it up, and then you squeeze it on the abdomen. And it transiently creates uh, pressure spikes uh, in the intracranial space. That's what we're measuring. Boom, boom. So that's how we test it, and then sort of lining up with the, uh, with the, with the gold standard. So with that, uh, I'll just uh, wrap up then and um, remind you that uh, you know, I've, I've told you about diff different things that allow you to do skin-like electronics and gave you a specific clinical example in neonatal intensive care uh, unit monitoring, uh, and that works extremely well. Uh, and then you know, uh, transient uh, electronics and uh, you know, these uh, uh, bioresorbable intracranial pressure sensors are one, one uh, example of that. Uh, so let me just conclude by acknowledging senior collaborators. Uh, it's all very interdisciplinary, so we work with many folks who have uh, expertise complementary to our own in physical and biological sciences. Uh, but we like the clinical interface, not that this dominates everything that we do, uh, but we'd like to have some translational component uh, to a lot, a lot of our work. So Amy Pollard and NICU, Brian Lev and Epilepsy, uh, Rory Murphy is the TBI surgeon, Mark Schlepian is a fairly prominent interventional cardiologist at uh, University uh, of Arizona. 
But uh, I see a lot of students, and uh, the students are actually the most important people, so I always save them for last. Uh, they do all the work, I just get to talk about it. So this is a, this is a picture of a group party right before you know, kind of the move to, to Northwestern. And, uh, great group of people. Uh, it makes the group, group look a little bit larger than it really is because that's not a postdoc, uh, and that's not, <laughs> not a graduate student, but you get the idea. So thanks a lot for your attention. Yeah, we work with uh, Guillermo Amir at uh, Northwestern. Uh, he has a uh, biodegradable elastomer chemistry. We published one paper on that a few years ago, um, I think three years ago. So um, that just adds a whole other set of complications in terms of <laughs> building the devices, because there aren't very many elastomers. It's a citric acid-based uh, polymer that he's developed. And it has some challenges in terms of surface adhesion. You can kind of do things. But right now, for us, you know, the stretchable piece is more or less decoupled from the, from the transient piece. So we do all kinds of things in transient electronics that don't require stretchability. So I think it's a great question, but it's probably kind of a next step beyond where we are right now, because we're pretty busy with all kinds of stuff uh, that we can address. Just a very quick follow-up question. Your biodegradability is based on size. Is it, is it because of the nano thickness that makes it biodegradable? Well, the chemistry is the same whether it's a silicon wafer or a very thin silicon nano membrane, right? So uh, the chemistry of dissolution is the same, but um, unless it's thin, it's not biodegradable on any type of uh, time scale that, that's relevant, right? So, so thin geometry is, is important, but you have to have a material that intrinsically is dissolving. So thin titanium will never, never dissolve, for example. It's not like everything is reacting with, with water. Uh, it's just luck that silicon is, is, is reacted with water and that the end products of that reaction are biocompatible. It's almost like a miracle. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. So you can go off and do all kinds of stuff at a pretty, pretty high level right, in terms of performance because of that. Uh, otherwise, I think you're, you're kind of stuck. Zinc oxide is another one, but you know, mobility is not, not that good. So that, that's the only other si a semiconductor. Silicon, germanium, silicon germanium are as well. But, but silicon is by far sort of the mo most powerful choice. Well, what I'm wearing on my skin is commercial. Those devices over there are commercial with L'Oreal. We have a company called uh, MC10. They've sort of um, you know, commercialized a uh, uh, more, more sophisticated device than the one, that, one I'm wearing or the one that L'Oreal is selling that um, is based on Bluetooth electronics and embedded batteries. So it doesn't have the kind of the full skin-like geometry, but it's still stretchable. I mean, it has all of that core kind of IP embedded in it. Uh, and they launched that as a kind of a research tool product. You can go to the web and order some if you want. Um, uh, last year, it's at CES. And so you know, we're pretty excited about it. I think it's probably the only wearable that's not <laughs> this kind of architecture, right? And so as a consequence, it's pretty agnostic to where you put it, put it on the body. And so you can do kind of full body kinematics. Uh, you can do full body hemodynamics uh, in terms of you know, looking at how blood, blood is flowing. And so, so they're working with uh, various groups on monitoring uh, Parkinson's patients at home, for example, picking up early signs of, of tremors and so on. Uh, stroke rehab with the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. They have work in uh, uh, total knee replacement rehab around, around that as well. Um, so, and then there are lots of kind of sports and fitness type, type interactions. So it programs with the Bears, the Cubs, uh, and the Lakers right, right now, look, looking at that, sort of monitor training. Monitor sort of reproducibility in uh, things like free throw shooting. <laughs> you can measure all the EMG and the motion associated with that. Uh, try to make, make the athletes better, I, I guess. So, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're very interested in that. Um, I would say day to day, my focus though is on sort of the front end, exploratory, you know, academic oriented, you know, mentoring these guys uh, and, and trying to sort of develop the next generation. Um, so I don't have any day to day role on the, on the commercial side, but, but interested in that because I think the impact is uh, ultimately gonna be governed by your ability to get things out of the academic lab and out. Anyway, that's a long answer, but a good question. One of the 
the key characteristics you spoke about at the very beginning in terms of these wearable electronics was permeability. Yeah. You say yeah. About that. So just give us a sense of how permeable they are under what different environments and how you build them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. Right. So if you think about the, the architectures here, I mean, it's a multi-material sort of heterogeneous system in that sense. And so you're, you're thinking in terms of bulk, like system level uh, permeability is probably the most relevant thing. But um, because of this kind of open architecture, you don't have to figure out how to make silicon sort of water and air permeable. You induce the permeability in the open spaces in between. So then the question is, what is the material in between these, these filaments and so on? And as I mentioned, you know, we like silicones because they're already FDA approved. They're pretty widespread use in skin bandages. At sufficiently small thicknesses, they're also pretty, pretty permeable uh, as well. And so this device doesn't have any physical uh, perforations in it, but, but the thickness of the elastomer is down to kind of the 10 micron level. And unless you're profusely sweating, uh, that's good enough in, in terms of allowing uh, bi biofluid uh, transport. So that's kind of the way that we do it. Again, physical perf perforations can, can help in certain scenarios as well. Um, but, but it's important because if you have a device that's trapping sweat at the surface of the skin, it will cause all kind of irritation. Can't, it can't do it. You know, it's not just uncomfortable. It causes redness and um, inflammation at the, at the skin surface. So it's a very important consideration. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, great question. I don't, I don't know if I have the sli slides handy, but you know, um, and, I, and I didn't talk talk much uh, about it because um, it sort of gets gets outside of the scope. But I gave a talk at Harvard two days ago, and I actually show got got into some of the more nitty gritty details about the design. But we like fractal math in terms of defining the geometries, and you know. Turns out to be a very systematic way to do space filling curves, and the self similarity gives rise to mechanics that's dominated by sort of a, a hierarchy of springs. Anyway, there are a lot, a lot of advantages to it, and uh, this was a system. The cables you're, you're mentioning, so this this is probably not as sophisticated as you get. This is a piano fractal, and you can control the the geometry of the building blocks of those piano uh, structures to offer let's say biaxial stretchability, which is what we're doing with this geometry here for these pads, which are interface to the skin for measuring e EEG. So we're doing the mastoid here, and then we have reference and uh, ground electrodes on the auricle. And then these are the interconnecting cables that are connecting that electrode to that to that, and then uh, off to external electrons. So here we design not biaxial stretchability. We just needed stretchability along the length, right? We don't need it orthogonal to that. And so we've optimized the, the layout of the fractal to provide that kind, kind of mechanics. So that's a very good question. I just didn't have a chance to get into that. Yeah, I imagine um, contact, a good contact is important for wearable sensing, both externally and internally. Can you talk to any challenges you may have had with adhesives for skin where cells turn over very quickly or for yeah, I mean, I think you've kind of put your finger on, on something that's very, very, very important. So um, on the skin, the skin is dry enough. There are plenty of bandage, uh, you know, adhesives that are already FDA approved. We kind of just use those. And, um, you know, we, we've looked at, in great detail at sort of the thickness and the width of these kind of traces and that their ability to sort of follow the contours. I mentioned a little bit there. Uh, in, in one, one of the slides. So, so if you're attentive to those kinds of issues, you're um, using sort of the state of the art in terms of um, you know, adhesives. The skin is re really not, not a big problem, uh, but internal organs are because uh, they're, they're wet and slippery and they're moving around, right? So, so we have systems now that are designed to uh, address <coughs> bladder dysfunction with an engineering approach rather than a pharmaceutical approach. And the reason why I mention that is we've gotten stuck on how do you integrate a strain gauge uh, around the diameter of the bladder? Because it's slippery, it's moving around, it inflates by you know, a factor of 10 or something like that. And as it, inf it fills and voids, the, the strain gauge is like move, moving all over the place. So, so it gets to be tricky. I mean, we um, don't have a great solution for that right now, I would say. 
Um, there are some surgical adhesives uh, that are out there that, that you can kind of use. Uh, suturing the device in to adjacent tissue is kind of a quick, quick solution. But I think there's some great you know, opportunities there for ideas and new, new materials or, or mechanics approaches. So I think we kind of solved it in the bladder, but not in the most uh, elegant way. And it comes up over and over again. Brain, brain is not too bad. It's not moving around a lot, but the heart, same problem. Uh, there you can suture in. There's enough muscle tissue, but the bladder, you know, you penetrate the bladder wall. It's not good. So <laughs> it's hard to suture that. Um, that's a good question. Any further questions? Yeah, just one on your, um, the things that you're thinking about going into the body. I see that some of them are passive. Would you view that any of these are going to be active electronics have transistors or things like ours that can phosphorus? Well, yeah, so we've thought about that. I mean, you can use phosphorus and boron. You don't have to use arsenic, right? So, so that's what we do. But even arsenic, if you look at the total amount of arsenic you need to highly dope uh, silicon, and you look at sort of FDA regulations around arsenic content in the body, it's tiny. It's possible, like, very local to where, where the silicon is and where it's dissolving. You might have a peak concentration right there at some transient moment during the dissolution where arsenic level might, might get high. Uh, but but if you look at it, you know, at, at a global sense, it's it's a tiny, tiny amount of arsenic. And then we just don't use it, <laughs> so yeah. we just use uh, boron instead. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have any long-term Yeah, that's good. We we have not. Yeah. So so I mean, yeah. So, so in terms of biocompatibility, you have you know sort of molecular chemical uh, level considerations, and then kind of what we've focused on because other people <laughs> spend a lot of time on that to focus on the mechanics and, and the geometry. And um, we have done uh, longitudinal studies on very tiny optoelectronic systems that we implant down in the brain. So th those have been in animals for as long as a year and a half. And I would say compared to other things that people are putting in the brain, like DBS electrodes you mentioned before, we see much reduced gliosis and, and fibrosis. So, um, and I think it's because of the mechanics, although we have not systematically proven that, uh, it, it looks better just because it takes a lot of time to do those systematic studies. So it's a great question. We just don't have a lot of, lot of experience with it. The, the, the brain penetrating optoelectronics, we do. Those are uh, mouse models. But for the other devices, say the, the brain monitoring systems or uh, you know, our heart monitoring devices I showed in the slide, we got stuck on the uh, challenge of just keeping biofluids out, like forget it, forgetting about the biological response. How do you keep you know, biofluids from penetrating the encapsulating layers and uh, infiltrating in, into the electronics over time scales that are relevant for chronic implants. So again, sort of life, life of the patient. And that is hard because you're constrained to maintain this thin geometry to get you the mechanics that you want, uh, but you need thick layers to, to serve as good, good biofluid barriers. So you look at a pacemaker or DBS system, all of the electronics are in a ceramic can or a titanium enclosure with thicknesses, wall thicknesses of uh, millimeters, right? And so, so we can't do that. So we got stuck for about five, six years trying to figure that out because there's no polymer uh, that's hermetic. All, all, water's coming through just different rates on, on different polymers. And most deposited coatings, if you have one point defect, you're done because the water will go through, short it out, it's, it's over, right? So you need defect-free encapsulating layers that are not polymers over square centimeters. And that turned out to be very hard. The solution, we published it over, over, the, uh, over the summer, is you grow thermal oxide on a silicon wafer, which is a wonderful platform you know, in terms of uh, smoothness and, and materials uni uniformity. And that thin layer of glass turns out to be like spectacularly good uh, as a biofluid barrier. It sort of makes sense because it's used in the electronics industry. You have leakage problems of gate, gate uh, electrodes. So, so that's what we've done. But we've only done that recently. So we don't have a wealth of data addressing your question, primarily be because of that. Uh, but we have uh, devices in, in rats now at, I don't know, 18, 24 months or so with, with the sheet geometry, not just the, the, the penetrating pins. And so it looks good, but I, but I think your question is, is very relevant and I don't have a great answer to it. Well, wonderful. So we have uh, come to a close for this session and uh, we want to appreciate uh, Professor John Rogers come all the way to Dahmer's and then skin to claim it's happy to be Dahmer's. So this is a <laughs>